I will invite Dr. Neeraj Bhutani from Jaipur who will be talking on basics of electrodiagnosis for nerve and plexus injuries. Till far we have always uh, listened about the surgical strategy in the management. Now he will be covering the diagnostic methods and electrophysiology is one of the very important in the diagnosis of uh, brachial plexus and peripheral injuries. Dr. Bhutani, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I would be talking in brief about the basics of electrodiagnosis for nerve and plexus injury. And electrodiagnosis basics and very primitive I would be talking about because now there are a lot of limitations and very advanced neuroimaging has come. So the role of electrodiagnosis is limited at it was 20 years ago. The aims of electrodiagnosis is usually to come from the diagnosis, localization, assessment of extent and severity. So localization, assessment of extent and severity is the most important aim of electrodiagnosis and most of the requests uh, we receive from clinicians and surgeons, they ask for our help in localizing and assessing the extent and severity. And another important part is assessment of prognosis because if we are not getting any motor responses, the prognosis is not good. Uh, there are certain terminologies which we use. So ENMG is electroneuromyography, which is the correct terminology, which includes NCS and EMG both. NCS is nerve conduction study. EMG earlier used to include uh, complete NCS and EMG, but now at least in India, if you write EMG, it means only needle EMG because the private labs are doing it. So their uh, expense involved is different when we do only conductions and when we put the needle. And SNAP is sensory nerve action potential, CMAP is compound muscle action potential when we stimulate a motor now and MUAPs are motor unit action potential when we put a needle in the muscle and we activate the muscle. So this is over simplistic uh, classification of brachial plexus injury, I'll skip that. So <clears throat> I would be talking about the basics and applications of sensory nerve conduction studies in brachial plexus injury, motor nerve conduction studies and needle EMGs. So for sensory nerve conduction studies, we can do the stimulation antidromically or orthodromically. Orthodromic means in the direction of the flow of the current which is distal to proximal in a sensory nerve. And we study distal latency, amplitude and conduction velocities. Common nerves studied are median, ulnar and radial. But in brachial plexus injury, medial and lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerves are also important for differential. And in lower limb, uh, we study superficial peroneal and sural nerves. So this is a typical sensory nerve action potential. As you can see, this is the amplitude, this is the distal latency, and you divide distance and distal latency, you get a conduction velocity. And what are the applications of these sensory nerve and, uh, conduction studies? If you know the anatomy of the plexus, the electrodiagnosis will help you in localization. Like if you st uh, stimulate median nerve from index finger and record SNAP, the trunk involved is upper and cord is lateral. Similarly, lateral entry brachial cutaneous has the similar distribution, but same median nerve, if you stimulate middle finger and record, then the lateral cord is involved and middle trunk is involved. For the radial nerve or um, posterior cord and upper or middle trunk, you can study. Similarly, from the little finger, if SNAP is preserved, means you are studying the ulna nerve, lower trunk or the medial cord. So if you know the anatomy, uh, uh, this is stimulation, sensory nerve action potential, selective involvement or non-involvement will help you in localization. So what are the applications? Uh, one of the most important application is whether the injury is preganglionic or a postganglionic. We have a dorsal root ganglia. So if the injury is beyond that dorsal root ganglia, that is postganglionic injury, the sensory arc is affected and you don't get an SNAP in the affected area. While in preganglionic injuries, because the sensory arc is intact, you get an SNAP in affected area. And then selective involvement may suggest site of involvement like if a median and radial SNAP are preserved but the medial antibrachial is affected then it may suggest a lower trunk injury. Sometimes it helps you in the localization in particular nerve injury suppose there is a radial neuropathy but radial SNAP is preserved so you know that the lesion is distal to the origin of superficial cutaneous radial nerve and just above the posterior interosseous nerve and uh, sometimes in 
various syndromes like anterior syndrome, uh, median SNAP will be preserved. And this is another example I am giving how to apply it. Suppose median SNAP is absent from the thumb or index finger, involved is upper trunk, median SNAP is absent from middle finger, middle trunk is involved and median SNAP is absent from ring finger and ulnar from little finger, then you have involvement of lower trunk. So this helps you in localization. This is the most classical application of SNAP that if your injury is preganglionic, that is beyond before the ganglia, SNAP is preserved, which is not there in motor nerve stimulation. So then we come to motor nerve conduction studies. This stimulation is always orthotromic and uh, now is stimulated at two point one is distal and one is proximal as against to the sensory nerve and this helps us in getting a conduction block conduction block means a 50 percent drop in amplitude between two sides uh, we can study almost all uh, motor nerves of brachial plexus some are easier to study like sensory we study distal latency amplitude and conduction velocities but in addition, we can study F wave and H reflexes also, which indicates more proximal lesions around the root. So this is a typical uh, motor nerve conduction study. You can see this is a distal stimulation, this is proximal stimulation, this is amplitude, and you divide and uh, take the distance and you get the conduction velocity. So this is a normal CMAP. Now application is that to assess the presence and severity of injury. Uh, so I will show you the graphs first. So this is an axonal loss where you can see that both proximal and distal, the amplitude has become very low. If injury is severe, the CMAP will become absent. Then you can study a conduction block. This is the normal. This is distal stimulation is normal, but proximal you see a more than 50% drop. So you know that the injury is between these two segments. And you can further do an inching method, that is you stimulate nerve every centimeter to localize the exact site of the injury, which we do typically in ulnar neuropathy at elbow. And then you can study the F waves, that is one you stimulate directly and get an M response from muscle, but the impulse go backwards also and again come back and stimulates the muscle. So because the impulse goes backwards up to the root, so we get two waves, one is M and one is F. So F is impaired means the lesion is at the proximal level. And then H reflex, H reflex is similar to uh, M, uh, F, uh, F wave, but the only thing is that uh, it is studied in mainly lower limb and dorsal root is also involved. So these are the applications, uh, presence and severity of injury and we can study conduction block. Then coming to the needle EMG, in needle EMG, a needle is inserted into the belly of the muscle and muscle is tested in resting and activated condition both and what combination of muscles we are testing depending upon the clinical suspicion or confirmation of the nerves which are involved. It is a most operator dependent procedure and because needle is inserted, it causes some discomfort which is usually tolerated by the patient. What we study in needle EMG is we study one is insertional activity when we insert the needle. Then we study the spontaneous activity when muscle is in resting position. Then we activate the muscle and some motor unit will start firing. Then we will do this MUAP analysis. We will assess their size, their configuration, duration. And then we further activate the muscle and study the recruitment. And after maximal activation, study the interference pattern. So spontaneous activity, usually normal muscle will not show any spontaneous activity. Only abnormal muscle will show spontaneous activity. Among all these spontaneous activities, fibrillation potential and positive sharp waves are important in nerve injury as they will indicate active denervation. Fasciculations, myotonia, complex repetitive discharges are usually seen in anterior holes and disorders or muscle disorders. So most important for nerve injuries, fibrillations and positive sharp waves. So this is a fibrillation, initial deflection is positive and this is a positive sharp wave. This is a fibrillation. So they both signify the same thing, although the configuration of wave is different. This is how we see fibrillation when there is an active denervation in the muscle. So how to apply it? Presence of fibrillation potentials and positive sharp waves suggest that the muscle is actively denervating 
and this denervation will start variably from 8 to 20 days after the nerve injury it will last up to 3 months but occasionally it can last up to 9 months also and what are the applications like paraspinal muscles if you insert needle and if you show evidence of active denervation it indicates a preganglionic lesion at the root level similarly for example denervation of serratus anterior will suggest a root level but denervation of supraspinatus will suggest a proximal upper trunk level and very importantly in long flexors and extensors muscles of the forearm if we study denervation in various muscles it can help us in localizing as per their nerve supply that which nerve is affected and where and similar and like external carpi radialis longus uh, if it is spared means the lesion is more distal just for example i am telling because the nerve 2 ecrl is quite proximal then we do MUAP analysis which we activate the muscle and do it usually in routine EMG we do it to ascertain between neurogenic and myopathic MUAPs but in case of nerve injury our purpose is to assess re-innervation so this is a normal simple motor unit where one fiber and is supplying 10 muscle fibers and you get a simple MUAP and this is the basics of re or basis of polyphasia or long duration you can see there is an axonal loss so the motor unit is expanding so it's like a simply if you have 10 ropes and 200 pipes to bind them you will bind a bundle of 20 pipes in with each rope but if you have only four ropes you have to bind 50 pipes in one bundle so your bundle is very big and deformed and this is the neuropathic muap indicating re because motor unit has become bigger as opposed to in myopathy where motor unit becomes smaller so this is we do mainly to study uh, whether re is taking place or not and this is interference pattern because of the axonal loss you can see the decreased recruitment of motor unit and there is a gap in between which is normally not there so timing of electrodiagnosis is important MUAP dropout is immediate but CMAP and SNAP may be initially preserved for 2-3 days and then they will begin to drop and like I have said earlier that fibrillation potentials may take some time to appear and the limitations and how to limit those limitations one is timing of this study is very important Another limitation is you cannot detect re when muscle has no power because sometimes we receive requests that they want to check the re of the muscle. When muscle has zero power, we can't activate and can't check re -innervation. If muscle has power, you already know that re is taking place. And uh, complex proximal lesion may mask additional lesion. So here uh, imaging wins over electrodiagnosis and severe postganglionic lesion may mask additional preganglionic lesion. So we need a good referral note and a clear clinical question from the surgeon or clinician that what they want to know from EDX. So even if EDX is non-contributory, it can be clearly communicated that we cannot answer this question and you have to go by your other imaging modalities. But it should not be that report is incomprehensible to the referring surgeon. So communication is important and another important thing is that local site should be uh, accessible to EDX and many times the local site is wounded, plastered and lot many things are there. So in that case imaging is definitely more contributory to rather than electrodiagnosis. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nija, Niraj. Um, I have to say there were a couple of things that you mentioned in your presentation that I thought were extremely interesting. So, uh, one point in the last but one slide when you mentioned that um, a severe postganglionic injury may actually mask a preganglionic injury. And this is something that, especially for the young people, 